Last time, we looked at the Republican Party's response to our economic problems. Rather than admitting that our system rewards those who are already rich, politicians like Trump or Paul Ryan in the Obama era make vague gestures towards the idea of equal opportunity. Of course, they don't actually believe in giving everyone a fair shake, which is obvious when you look at the policies they support. I'm not sure how they can call themselves the party of equal opportunity when they allow some kids to grow up without food, health care, or a decent education, and legislation like Trump's tax cut or their reluctance to pass a second round of stimulus show that they couldn't care less about working people. Which brings us to our opposition, the Democrats. Today we'll take a look at the Democratic Party's politics to see if they are offering a way forward. So when I say the Democratic Party's politics, I'm not talking about what they say they support, I'm talking about what they actually do. And if we look at how the Democrats respond to things like the killing of George Floyd, Trump's presidency, the college debt crisis, and the other issues of the day, we can see that they engage in politics on a completely symbolic level. When George Floyd was murdered by a police officer in May 2020, it was a grim reminder of the long-running problem of police brutality in the United States. Floyd's murder inspired people from cities all around the country to take to the streets in protest, demanding change. Among the demands were things like banning chokeholds, creating a database that tracks abusive officers, and defunding the police. How did the House Democrats respond? By draping themselves in African cloths and kneeling. The cloths in question are kente, a woven fabric that comes from Ghana. And sure, they look nice, but I don't see how wearing Ghanaian fabric helps anyone, especially when people have proposals of how to actually change things. There are real policies on the table here, but rather than engaging with them, the Democrats want to keep their political action completely symbolic. Another symbolic gesture was made by the Democrat mayor of D.C., Muriel Bowser, who ordered a giant Black Lives Matter mural to be painted. Similarly to the Kente Cloth episode, a giant mural was not one of the protesters' demands. The Black Lives Matter organization called Mayor Bowser out for this, condemning the mural as performative. Once again, people demand material change, and Democratic politicians respond with symbolism. Another area where the Democratic Party has valued style over substance was in their opposition to Trump. In the Trump era, Democrats defined themselves as the party of resistance, with House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi front and center. In the words of this Guardian article, Pelosi was the woman who stood up to Trump, a title she earned through a series of highly publicized clashes with the president. One of these clashes came in October 2018, when Pelosi was photographed telling Trump off during a meeting. Because of her defiant posture and the fact that she was the only woman in the room, the image became a viral hit. An article in Vogue brought in four art experts to analyze the photo and talk about how important it was. One expert compared it to a portrait of Jean Baptiste Belay, a Haitian revolutionary who successfully fought to free his people from slavery and protected their rights from French Republicans who wanted to reintroduce white rule. What made the Pelosi image so compelling to people was the symbolism. It allowed them to project themselves onto Pelosi and imagine what they would do if they were in a room with Trump. So the picture wasn't popular because it showed a victory over Trump on a concrete level, it was completely symbolic. Pelosi's next moment of performative politics was when she clapped at Trump during his 2019 State of the Union speech. This was hailed as a historic victory because she appeared to be clapping sarcastically. It made a huge splash on social media with Pelosi receiving fawning coverage but like the earlier photo with Trump, it was completely symbolic. It doesn't represent any substantive victory over Trump, it's just spectacle. Also, Pelosi later admitted that the clapping wasn't actually sarcastic. A year later, at Trump's 2020 State of the Union speech, Pelosi pulled off another stunt. She was caught on video ripping up a copy of Trump's speech, which received viral attention. Once again, this is pure performance. It didn't change anything, it was just something to make conservatives mad on Twitter. Also, it was an opportunity for Pelosi to make money. She came out with a t-shirt reading, He shredded the truth, so I shredded his speech. 
I also managed to track down a t-shirt of Pelosi clapping with the caption Shade. These moments of political performance don't really accomplish anything aside from earning media hype and selling t-shirts. Now, if you were only paying attention to the headlines on social media, it might have seemed like Pelosi and the Democrats were doing a great job of resisting Trump. But if you look at the legislation that was being passed, especially the bills that increased military spending and gave Trump more surveillance powers, not so much. In November 2019, Democrat leaders voted to extend the Patriot Act, keeping in place the measures that allowed the NSA to spy on people without a warrant. A month later, while they were in the middle of impeaching him, House Democrats gave Trump $738 billion in defense spending. And in May 2020, Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell worked together to pass a bill that allows the FBI to investigate people with less oversight. Pelosi and the Democrats made a big deal of confronting Trump on Twitter and through symbolic opposition, but on things that really matter, like strengthening the surveillance state and enriching the defense industry, they worked alongside Trump. The resistance to him was mostly performative. Another example of the Democrats' focus on superficial symbolism comes from Hillary Clinton, who tweeted out these two pictures. The first shows the White House under the Obama administration, when it was lit up in rainbow colors to support the Marriage Equality Act. The second picture shows the White House under the Trump administration, with its lights turned off because of the George Floyd protests. People on Twitter claimed that this represented how Trump was abandoning his duty to the country and hiding, but it turned out this photo was actually from 2014 and photoshopped to look darker. Now, I think Clinton was trying to make a point about how Obama was better than Trump on LGBTQ issues, but if we look at these pictures literally, all she's saying is that depending on who is president, the White House will have a different lighting scheme. Like the kente cloth or the BLM mural, this is emphasizing style over substance. Now, I'm not saying that only the Democrats do this. Trump's stunt of waving a Bible near the White House was obviously a photo op, a symbolic gesture towards his Christian supporters. And who could forget when he started off a speech by hugging a flag to show how patriotic he was. So this is an issue that affects both parties. But as I said earlier, the Republicans don't even pretend to care about making things better. So I'm focusing on the Democrats today. We can see the formula of style over substance in the Democratic Party's rhetoric over and over but it also gets into their policy proposals. If we can turn our brains back to July 2019, when future Vice President Kamala Harris was still running for president, we might be able to recall one of her most infamous proposals. A student loan debt forgiveness program for Pell Grant recipients who start a business that operates for three years in a disadvantaged community. There are two problems with a policy like this. Number one, it's not generous enough to make a substantial improvement in anyone's life. And two, it's so specific it might only apply to like a hundred people. If we look at how this proposal is constructed, the purpose becomes obvious. It's built around buzzwords that make us feel good by signaling towards social justice. The Pell Grant part conjures up imagery of people working their way up the ladder through merit. The starting a business part reminds us of the great American entrepreneurial spirit, and the disadvantaged communities bit signifies racial and economic justice. Proposals like this are not going to make a dent in the great obstacles that prevent people from achieving success. But that's not the point. The point is to seem like you care about improving things while you help maintain the status quo. Another example comes from LA Mayor Eric Garcetti who shared his plan to help people struggling to pay for things during the pandemic. His policy? A 20% discount on parking tickets. This is the same formula as the Harris policy. Talk about how much you care, and then offer a token gesture that only helps a few people a little bit. Finally, we have this statement from President-elect Joe Biden. I used to say, you've heard me say it before, Joey, I don't expect the government to solve my problems but I expect them at least to understand my problems. The folks I'm talking about, the folks out there aren't looking for a handout. What they need 
They need us to understand. The job of the Democratic Party, according to Joe Biden, is not to solve problems. It's to say, I understand your problems, and I get what you're going through, but I'm not actually going to do anything about it. So why do Democrats do this? Why do they prefer to make symbolic gestures rather than focusing on concrete policy? I think there are three main reasons. The first has to do with the incentives of the modern media landscape. If you want to get media coverage as a politician, you should put on a spectacle. Performative things like shredding a speech, clapping sarcastically, or waving around a Bible get coverage because they are dramatic, and because people want icons or heroes who stand up for their values. There's also the issue of the partisan nature of media. People want to see the other side get angry, whether it's cable news or on Twitter. Conservatives were furious when Pelosi shredded the speech, with Mike Pence saying she might as well have been shredding the Constitution. So the symbolic owns the shade. It's flashy and exciting in a way that policymaking isn't. The second reason why symbolic politics is so common is that it doesn't get in the way of fundraising. Short of AOC bringing a guillotine to Central Park, Conducting your politics through symbolic gestures doesn't threaten the special interest groups that support the Democratic Party. Promising single-payer health care is a threat to private insurance companies, a Green New Deal threatens oil companies, an anti-war stance threatens the defense industry, and raising taxes threatens the rich. Draping yourself in kente cloth and kneeling doesn't threaten anyone, so you can continue to collect checks from billionaires and corporate interests. The last reason why Democrats do performative politics is because it's just the way people think about political action. You can make the argument that Democrats choose symbolism over material politics because they are corrupt, but I don't think that's always true. I think for many Democrats, performance and symbolic gestures are just the way you do politics. When the Democratic Party under Bill Clinton chose to adopt Reagan's program of deregulation, free trade, and spending cuts, it created a bipartisan consensus on economic issues. Following that shift, most Democrats accepted Wall Street and corporate interests as permanent fixtures in American politics, and began looking at them as potential allies rather than enemies. So in a world where corporate rule is just a way of life, and both parties agree on the fundamental makeup of the economy, how can you distinguish yourself except by performing? However, now that the consensus on the economy is breaking down, new possibilities are opening up. But if we want to change things, we have to ditch the old ways of pandering and signaling in favor of a politics rooted in real economic change. We need to have a concrete vision of what the future could look like, and what levers of power we need to make it happen. And as we've seen with the Trump resistance, if you only define yourself in opposition to the right, and not in terms of what you actually want, the movement will trend towards symbolic gestures. So, we need material politics with clear goals and strategies. Single-payer health care, a Green New Deal, full employment. Because if we let ourselves think that sarcastic clapping is a political program, we're not going to get anything done. Thank you for watching.